Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's TechSoup for Libraries webinar. My name is Crystal, and I'll be your host. Today we're taking a look at libraries as innovation hubs and community-driven design processes. Public libraries are hubs for innovation and community engagement, and library workers listen closely to community needs to design programs and services to re that are responsive to continuous changes. Today we have two guests joining us to share examples of community-driven design processes that, have, that they have used to spark innovative solutions. Uh, but before we begin, I have just a few announcements. Uh, today we will be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We will be tracking your questions throughout the webinar and will answer them at the designated Q&A section at the end. All of your chat comments will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we will forward them back out with the entire group. You do not need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number that we've shared in the chat. If you're having technical issues, please send us a chat message and we'll try to assist you. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you're called away from the webinar, or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of this webinar later. You will receive an archive email within a few days that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you are tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. And we have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so you can join us in the conversation there. TechSoup Global is dedicated to serving the world's nonprofit organizations and libraries. TechSoup was founded in 1987 with a global network of partners. We connect libraries and nonprofits to the technology, resources, and support they need so that you can operate at your full potential, more effectively deliver your programs and services, and better achieve your missions. TechSoup has helped to distribute over 14 million software and hardware donations to date through our product donation program. We offer a wide range of software, hardware, and services available to public libraries and nonprofit organizations. This includes products from Microsoft, Adobe, and Symantec. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. And for today's webinar, we're joined by two guests. Sarah is now currently uh, the Director of Community Engagement for Caravan Studios, a division of TechSoup, where she works with communities to develop tools that help organize, access, and use local resources to address pressing problems. She spent the past 17 years strengthening communities by focusing on the power of public libraries in towns big and small, and it's worth noting that she developed and led for many years the library program here at TechSoup. Chris Kayak works as an Information Systems Specialist for the Alameda County Library where he is one part librarian, one part systems administrator. He has a deep interest in solving the problem of the digital divide and establishing the library as a community hub. My name is Crystal Schimpf and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Assisting us with chat we have Susan Hope Bard, and on Twitter we have Molly Bacon, both of, uh, joining us from the TechSoup team. Now we'll have time for Q&A uh, after each presenter, and we'll be tracking your questions throughout. So again, please share your questions in the chat as they arise. Now we'd like to know a little bit about you, so please tell us what type of library or other organization you're joining us from today. Um, so you can uh, review the choices here and click the radio button to select your, your um, answer and then click Submit. Um, and then you'll see your res uh, all of the results populating. And I see um, some people are, are – uh, well, we have mostly public library audiences so far. I'll give you a few more seconds to respond to this. Um, but I see some people coming in with the other uh, response category. I see a state library in the chat. Welcome. A nonprofit literacy organization organization. That's excellent to hear. So um, you can just tell us if you're from some other type of organization what that is. I see another state library. That's excellent. Um, and I see some academic and some special libraries responding as well. Um, looks like we're getting most of our responses in, so I'll just close the poll in just three, two, and one. Get a few last responses in there. And here are the final results. So 
uh, over 80% public libraries. And that's, you know, we do have both of our um, uh, guests today are speaking about examples that have a relationship to public libraries. But the concepts are applicable across all types of organizations. And certainly even in the public library setting, we're talking about maybe collaborating with community community uh, agencies as well. So hopefully if you've joined us from a uh, non-public uh, library entity, then you can still uh, apply some of these principles in your work, and it's great to see you here. All right. Um, and then the other thing, before we get started, um, I just wanted to uh, kind of set the stage. What do we mean when we are uh, talking about innovation and community-centered design? What is it that we're talking about today? And in brief, we're talking about uh, the way that libraries can bring people together in collaboration to find creative solutions to community problems. Problems and uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah's part of this is to share Caravan Studio's process for community-centered design to develop technology solutions to solve real problems. And this process has been successfully applied to projects with key libraries or with libraries as a key strategic uh, collaborator. Most recently in Indianapolis, and then Chris later will talk about the Alameda County Libraries Innovation Fest, which was a collaborative team challenge for public library staff. And the Innovation Fest was designed to help libraries library staff become more comfortable with design processes and with risk taking so that they could uh, um, create better solutions to serve uh, library patrons. So that's what is on our agenda for the day today. Um, so at this point, I think we're ready to hand things over to Sarah Washburn, Director of Community Engagement for Caravan Studios. Sarah? Hi. Thanks, Crystal. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. So, one of my favorite things to say is, this happened at the library. Whether I'm with friends, with strangers, at work, or sitting on the board of my local friends group, I love sharing what happens at libraries. So if you know me, you will have heard this before. Today I'm going to talk about my work and how libraries sit at the center of it. But first, a bit about me and my awesome team. I work for Caravan Studios, which is a division of TechSoup, the nonprofit behind this webinar. Caravan Studios works closely with communities to uncover problems and design solutions together. Mostly, these solutions are mobile apps, like what you see here. The first one on the left is SafeNight, an app that sends alerts when there's no shelter for a survivor of domestic violence or human trafficking. When you receive an alert, you can make a tax-deductible donation that pays for emergency shelter, a safe night in a hotel. And then next to that is the Range app, which you might have heard before, you can use Range to find where free food is served to youth in the summertime and also to find safe places like all of the public libraries in the U.S. Both of these apps were made with the community and both of these are free. So the short story is we make apps for social good. The longer story is we don't do it alone. We start off with generator sessions where we invite people who work in a particular issue area and then guide them through the first two phases of our community-centered design process that starts with a lot of questions, like these. And then it ends with designs for technology interventions, like this. But before I go further, I wanted to pause a moment to talk methodology. I imagine there's some process wonks in the crowd. So for you, I'll talk briefly about our methodology. It should look familiar to you if you know something about design thinking. But what's different is that the community owns what we're creating. Our first phase is called Generate. And really what happens here is we leave our assumptions at the door, our team, the Caravan Studios team. Sure, we've done some desk research, so we're conversant with the issues related to what we're discussing. But the ideas and the work is done by those in the room. Next, we have our design phase. This is when we bring participants to a point where they can balance the need and the users and the type of intervention that's possible and let them design the solutions. Select is simple. They vote. And by vote, I mean the broader community, not just the people who participated in the Generate session or the design session. This is when we bring the ideas out further into the community to really get a sense of what people think. The next is build. We build the text sometimes, or other times the community partner builds it. And sometimes 
what happens is we find someone who has already built something that meets the needs of the community, and we advocate for it or we share it and amplify it and sometimes help find funding to make it better. Our last phase in our methodology is called use. And that's what you could imagine. It's just getting the tools in the hands of people who need them. But we do this together with the community. So now that you know a tiny bit about how we do it, I'm going to talk about what we're doing in Indianapolis right now. It all started with an email from a stranger. A person from the city of Indianapolis who had seen the Range app was interested in us building something similar for them, maybe even a website, to help residents access resources for finding emergency food assistance in Indianapolis. But the thing is, we don't do that. We're not a design shop that makes apps. We're a nonprofit that creates the environment and the methodology for the community to identify problems they're facing so that we can design solutions together. So we decided to organize a two-day generate and design event starting with a question. How might we design solutions that connect Indianapolis residents to emergency food assistance? And we began planning to bring people together in Indianapolis. And just so you know, and I think you probably know this, but we're in San Francisco, so we're doing this locally in Indianapolis. And we did this at the Indianapolis Public Library. So you're probably thinking, right, space to convene, that makes sense. But that's only a tiny bit of this story. While it's true that the Indianapolis Central Library provided a gorgeous space for 25 or so of us to meet, they did much, much more. Because when librarians and staff participate in our events, magic happens. You might not know this about yourselves, but you're magic. It's true. So who was there? Well, participants at the Generate Design session were representatives from local pantries, nonprofits, from the city, from community-based organizations that help residents find food resources, from the local 211 organization, from the local university, and of course, from the library. And I'll say that a mix of participants had ne that had never been to the library were also there. So we provided ample time and a lot of encouragement to wander around the awesome library. The library itself was an inspiration. On breaks, people saw the movable seating areas where families lingered and ate together in the children's area, which is this right here, which is something I have never seen, and it was always full. In fact, there were three or so of them in the children's area. People marveled by how a 100-year-old building could be so wondrously fused to a 10-year-old addition, and everyone took time to go to the top floor and gaze across the gleaming city of Indianapolis. That's what you see on the sixth floor. And of course, there were people who participated who had been to the Central Library who were beaming with pride, so happy to share the library with others present. Just the act of us meeting at the library was community engagement. During the Generate and Design session, one thing it's really important to note is that what we do is not technical. It's an exercise in ideas, and librarians and staff are full of them. Librarians have participated as subject matter experts, community advocates, <clears throat> information specialists, and in general, just smart people. A memorable moment for me happened during our introductions at the start of the day when Melanie Whistle, the program development manager at the library, shared how she had attended some local meetings recently and had just learned about Indianapolis's struggle with becoming a growing food desert. She was actively planning how the library might engage with the public, and she shared with everyone her early ideas for the library's summer reading program called Read It and Eat. I'll let you Google their hashtag, but you should know that people oohed and awed and took note. The library is a smart organization to partner with. And this is the part of my presentation where I make my case for the library magic. It's been a consistent theme that including librarians and staff in the development of tools that solve local problems is magic. After librarians begin participating, other participants eventually approach the librarians in the room, exchange business cards, talk about collaborations, and share what the library does and can do. Librarians also help us all understand an issue. We held a generator session once on serving youth on the spectrum, and the librarians present talked about the library's resources, the knowledge the staff hold, 
and the intricate web of collaborations and partnerships libraries weave in their communities. They were also thoughtful and smart community advocates. During our design phase at the library, we guided the group through activities that helped take, them, take their ideas and questions and frame them into focused design statements that can be built into a technology tool. To flesh out their ideas and make them shareable visually, as a team, they imagine and develop what their app might look like in an app store, like this, the app store for range. So this is the example that we provided them. So this exercise in the design session, this is kind of the meat of it, and it entails some serious skills with, glues, with glue, scissors, construction paper, and sometimes even protractors. So this is what people end up doing once they've gone through the process and they're ready to, to start designing their app. Once their designs were complete, teams pitched their ideas to the rest of the group and received feedback from their colleagues. Remember how the person who originally contacted us had an idea of what the community needed? What's so interesting and what always happens is that people show up differently than they expect. That is, by listening to others, fleshing out ideas, and working collaboratively, people who identified one problem at the beginning ended up working on something completely different. And in the end, the three apps that were designed were very different from each other. Here they are. So this is Food Compass. This helps people understand what type of assistance they should apply for, how to do it, and what information they have, they have to provide to get the assistance. And as you can see, this is not a technical exercise. People have to know a little bit about apps, but not so much. They just have to know how to describe their idea and understand the audience they're trying to reach. The next is Pantry Power. Pantry Power provides information about local pantries in an effort to get potential volunteers to find the right opportunity. The app also provides an easy way to donate to a collective of pantries. This one's called Reasonable Ready Recipes. And this one, you, it's, I know that you can't see all the details, but I'll, I'll tell you and you'll be able to see them later. Reasonable Ready Recipes helps people on a budget learn how to cook healthy meals with five ingredients or less. It links to local stores and highlights sales on items. This one was really interesting. I watched it surface as par participants kept having side conversations about how cooking with healthy ingredients is a lost art and a necessary one. After the pitches, we then took their app designs home to our office in San Francisco and developed posters of their ideas like this. So you can see that we really just took their drawings and designed them to be, you know, to look, this, look similar with uh, little cell phone things around them, and then that's all their ideas, and then the pictures of them um, designing them. And these posters are currently displayed in over 30 locations across Indianapolis right now. So we, they are, people are seeing them all across the city at every library, at the Indianapolis Public Library, and at various community-based organizations, along with voting cards, so indie residents can vote on the app they like best. So this is, this is our select phase, when we go beyond the people who create it and outside into the community, so that we can find out, does this work for you? Would you use it? What, would, what do you like best? And what else do you wish this did for you? And I'll tell you right now, we're, we're, this, we're getting the feedback. In fact, I looked at it right before we got on this webinar. And what's so interesting is that a lot of people are saying that they want everything into one, or at least a couple of them to combine. But it's really creative, the ideas they're giving us and the organizations that are now aware of this and want to help us design it. So these posters um, are also translated. They're translated into Spanish and Hakuchen, which is Burmese, and displayed at key locations identified by the experts who, who were at the session. And here is um, a tweet from the Chin community of Indiana. And those are their translated posters, and people are voting there at that nonprofit in, in Indy. And here's the library. Here's one of the branches of the Indianapolis Public Library. And you can see in the front those, uh, those cards that they're using to vote. So you don't have to be in Indianapolis to vote. Um, people can also vote online from anywhere. 
This information will help us understand which features people like, how the designs might be improved, and it provides great context for us to take it to funders to get it built. And at the end of this pre presentation, I encourage you to visit the website and vote. And if you're in Indianapolis, go to the library or another location and, and share your ideas. So me telling this story is not because I expect all of you to replicate what our team does. Um, but there's aspects of our work that you're probably already are either already doing or you might just want to try. First, Get out and learn about your community. I know you're doing this already. You're information specialists. Find out what's going on. Find out what problems people are facing. Invite local organizations. Invite techies, students, students, local companies. Tell them what you're learning and find out what they know. Invite, invite people together. Get involved. Share what you're learning. And here's the thing, bring everybody together. Hold an event or a hackathon at your library. The thing that we notice the most about hackathons, and if you've ever been to one, you might have seen this as well, is that there's a great group of energetic people who want to solve problems, and what they have is the tech. They understand how to build things, but they don't necessarily know what the problem is or understand what's really useful. And if you can put some of your energy towards bringing those people together with the techies, hackathons or tech building exercises will go so much better because you'll have people advocating for real people who need solutions. So before I end, I just wanted to show you a picture of everyone who was there who designed these, uh, these apps. In fact, there's probably twice as many people. This is the people at the end of the second day, but these are all the people who designed these apps that people are actively seeing all over Indianapolis. And I just wanted to thank you guys. Thank you guys for listening. And really, please go to that website right there, the slash emergency food assistance, and look at the apps and share your two cents or share it with your patrons or whomever. We really want to know what you think. And, and truthfully, I expect that what gets built in Indianapolis will be not just for Indianapolis. It will be for people outside of that region. So it's really worth it to check it out. And you can follow the conversation on the hashtag Caravan Select and get in touch with me with any questions. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, Sarah, thank you for uh, sharing so much rich information over such actually a, a relatively short period of time. Um, and I just, uh, first off, just wanted to not only thank you, but let everybody know that um, we'll be sending out the slides so you got a chance to take a closer look at some of those images if you want to dive more deeply, or to look at some of those uh, steps of the process uh, that Sarah talked about. And hopefully uh, you might have some questions and you'll share the, those questions with us in the chat. Um, Sarah, I had one question maybe to start with. Um, and I, I'm actually going to take us back in the slides um, because early on you talked about the types of questions that you asked when you were going through um, some of your process. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just ask you what, uh, how you went about identifying these questions. And I think um, just to give some context here, is, is it the, uh, in the picture on the right, these are the questions mm -hmm. you were asking the people that you were working with, and they were responding with these post-it notes. Am I right about that? Yeah, actually not quite. So what happened okay. is that people were asked to, um, to think about the questions that they want solved. So what are the big burning questions that keep them up at night? And they did that on the um, post-it notes. And then we, um, we, we kind of distilled these down into bigger categories um, after we shared all this. And then people went and put their post-it notes that, um, that showed kind of the, the energy toward one particular category. So lots of, we didn't, not everybody shared everything they had because you can see that's a huge pile of sticky notes. Um, and so then they put them, so these are all questions and ideas that came from everyone in the room. So it wasn't us saying, how might we lower barriers to nutritious eating habits, it was them. Excellent, yeah. And I guess then part of the question I had was maybe around the, um, the process of, of, of um, creating these questions. Was there anything around that? Because you know sometimes it's hard to ask the right uh, question or come to that. So did you have any insight about that process of the, the question creation? 
Yeah, well, we, we lead them through this process that gets them to um, creating these how might we statements. And it, it is a way for them to, well, and I'll say there's a couple of things. We have a couple of ground rules when we're talking about like the, the problems that people face and, um, and then once we get to the how might we. So we've got the, the problems are the sticky notes. And what we do is we say you can't, the problems can't be concerned with money or, um, or staff because we can't create an app that's going to give you that. <laughs> um, and, so, and that's actually hard. I mean, it's really hard because a lot of problems, a lot of things that keep us up at night, um, especially under-resourced nonprofits, are about money and staff and you know, resources. And so we, um, we go through this process where we talk about the, the different sorts of ways to look at problems, and, and that helps people kind of compartmentalize what it is that they feel could actually lead to a technology intervention. And, I, and I'll say, when I say technology intervention, it's so that I don't say a mobile app because it's not always an app that we're creating. Great. And um, so what are other types of technology interventions, um, you know, other than a mobile app that you might help them create? Yeah, well, so um, one thing that, um, that I showed you earlier was the SafeNight app, but actually the SafeNight app is part of a larger system um, called the Safe Shelter Collaborative. And the Safe Shelter Collaborative helps um, domestic violence and human trafficking agencies in a particular region, so a geographical region, um, find shelter faster for their um, for, their, for survivors in their region. So what that means is that instead of them calling up an age, each agency every single day, and this is what a lot of um, DV and HT agencies do, is they call up other um, agencies in their region to find out if they have space for a survivor in their shelter. Instead of doing that, they use basically, it's a, um, it's a website, and it's a secure website where they're all connected, and they send enough non-identifying information about a, um, about a survivor to each other so that they can find out within minutes if there's space. And then if there isn't space, then they use Safe Night to um, alert people like you and me who want to help um, DV and HT organizations, and they if you have the Safe Night app, then you receive um, an alert and you can pay, make a tax deductible donation that pays for emergency shelter. And so that's a, we call that a service. That's not just the app. There's something that happens before that. And actually the, um, the website also provides the technology to send that alert to. So it's a much bigger system in that regard, whereas Range is a standalone app. Thank you for explaining that. Sure thing. Great. Uh, we have a couple of other questions that have come in, and I think we have time for them now. Uh, Laura asked, how did you make sure that non-English speakers were fully integrated into the process? That is a great, um, that's a great question. And I'm guessing that by process you mean um, by in the design sessions. Um, in our des in, so in our uh, Generate and Design session that we held in Indianapolis, um, everyone there was English speaking. However, people there worked at organizations that supported um, people who spoke Spanish and um, Hakka Chin, which is uh, Burmese. And that's how we knew that um, it was really important. So those people then, those, these are advocates, were there to tell us what was really important um, and what we needed to be thinking about. And so that, that's how that happened. They didn't speak the language, however, that was, you know, that was a translation activity that happened later. But as you saw the, at the Chin Center in Indianapolis, um, the Indie, people from the Indie Food Network work very closely with them, and people from the Indie Food Network were at our event. And oh, and I'm sorry. And then, and then those all, you know, being that everything is translated, the the cards where they vote and all of that is all in their local dialect. At, that, at those particular um, agencies and at the libraries. Right, excellent. Um, I think we have time for one more question before we move on. And actually this is a great one to end your section with. And I'm just coming back to your last slide where you, or one of your last slides where you were uh, offering suggestions. Uh, and the question mm -hmm. from Sarah is, 
Um, she says, wow, this is really cool. I would love to do something like this at my library. Any suggestions for getting started? So I'm bringing this back here because I know this was some of your bigger suggestions. But what might be next steps for libraries or other organizations looking to try this? I really think the first thing is identifying a problem, you know, looking outside of your library and finding a community problem that you think that you can, um, that you can bring other people around it so that it's not just the library tackling it alone. Um, you know, I, earlier I talked about Melanie at the Indie Library and how she had gone to commu a community meeting just recently and she had found out she hadn't known how serious the food desert situation in the city of Indianapolis is. And, it's, um, and just as a tangent, it's really easy to find out about that and it is really bad. And so she was already thinking about what the library could do, and it just happened that then I contacted her. <laughs> and that's how this all happened. Um, but she was already doing that work, and I think that's really, it's really an important thing. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you have to say, oh, and now we think we have to create an app to solve it. That, that doesn't have to be your solution. It, it happened to be ours. But I really think that bringing um, community-based organizations around that, around a particular problem, and the people who are who are um, who are troubled by that problem, and trying to find out, you know, what what can you do? And even if it were that um, you're stitching together these resources a little bit better, and providing them and making them known a little bit better to your patrons who are troubled by those problems, that in itself is a fantastic out, output, right? So. Um, I really do think that finding out, learning about what's going on and finding those problems and then bringing people together is a great next step. Right. Uh, well, Sarah, thank you for your presentation and for responding to questions. That's all the questions okay. we have time for right now. I'm just going to pop here one more time because uh, we've got your contact information in the slides and also um, uh, the links to the, the program with Caravan Studios and also the hashtag. And uh, at this point, we're going to move on and now hear from Chris Kayak, who's going to talk about the Innovation Fest at Alameda County Library, which was a staff-based uh, innovation and collaboration program. So Chris, why don't you take it from here? Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm really excited to share with you what I did with my Innovation Fest. So what was the Innovation Fest? The Innovation Fest was an eight-hour day. It was an in-house, library staff-focused team challenge for 60 people from different systems and classifications to come together and just dream up new ideas. Now, you might wonder, what caused this idea? Uh, I had attended an Atlassian conference, and one of the things they talked about was their ship it days which were 24 hours of what they describe as 24 hours of pure creativity, an in-house hackathon. And the idea for it was they can start and ship an idea in 24 hours. And by ship, I mean they start it, and it's actually a functional prototype 24 hours later. And I went, you know what? We should have this in libraries. So. My team and myself worked with Crystal and Carson Block to build the Innovation Fest. The Innovation Fest was an event designed to build innovation in libraries. In a nutshell, what I wanted Alameda County Library and attendees to learn was to risk bravely to dream up an idea as a team, then present on it in front, of a in front of a crowd, to risk together, and in doing so, innovate together, to get some of the best and brightest in libraries together in one room and see what happens. Now, one of my key goals was to increase connections, to break silos both between our own Alameda County community and all of the uh, logos on this slide are people who attended or were mentors 
uh, for the Innovation Fest. So it was between our own Alameda County community and the library community in the Bay Area. So as you can see from this slide, we had a huge range of different library systems attending. Systems from over 100 miles away came for the event, which I, I'm still boggled by. And we together found that we share the same silo of problems. But by working together, we found fresh perspectives. An example of this, at a very high level, it's a great way for an event like this to explore collaboration interdepartmentally. So for this example shows feedback from an, another Alameda County agency that we invited to the fest. It's a great way to show that um, the library is much more than just books. And that's a perspective or an assumption that we're still trying to um, show to other departments within Alameda County, within my own overarching uh, governmental entity. A, success, a second success was to build people's capacity for what we called ideation. We wanted people to learn high-level skills that we thought were crucial to innovation, to learn by doing, by practicing fast prototyping, risk management, and project management. And we knew that design and risk were not exactly things are used to doing on a regular basis. So we built a learning framework to guide the way, a sort of scaffolding. And this scaffolding helps staff learn to pivot throughout the day and ultimately bring all they had learned to a pitch in front of judges. And this was a success where participants expressed how they had liked how the FEST had allowed them to explore the unknown in what they called a free design space. And I wanted to close with this closing win. I believe that the FEST empowered staff to feel comfortable with innovation. We wanted to shift the paradigm to a risk-taking and continuous improvement-friendly culture, a culture that can embrace fresh perspectives, and an element of play as well, because uh, I believe that play is super critical in people being able to learn all of these really challenging ideas. And together, so that we can all together come to a dream of what if. And this is difficult to measure empirically, but I've had participants even among my own staff who are asking when the next fest would be. So I can consider that a success because people are already looking to the next what if we do this or that. And that is a success in my own mind. Now here are some, uh, in line with uh, being risk friendly, here are some fails that we encountered. So um, we planned a day-long event and we started this a year before and by the time it rolled around, we were in a major staff shortage. So uh, it's very difficult to work around and a lot of other libraries encountered this same issue. So uh, please be aware of this possible issue when you're uh, trying to come up with an event like this. And here's another big uh, fail. It's sort of the elephant in the room and one a question that I often get when I'm talking about the Innovation Fest with other people, which was, were there uh, significant progress on the projects and the ideas that were developed during the fest? And then, um, not really, because what we found was 
people were really excited during the fest, but they go back to their day jobs. And it's hard to find the time to continue working on the projects. But there's definitely still interest among the participants to do so. But in the next iteration of the fest, we would want to build in explicit project time for projects among attendees and their administration. And so here are some quick start steps if you want to put a similar event on. Definitely get administrative buy-in. There is a lot of moving pieces you need to uh, get approval for ahead of time. Like say, make sure you have your liability covered. Your, the staff time for whoever is organizing it as well as their team. Um, a budget. So ours was generously grant funded through an uh, innovation grant through the Pacific Library Partnership but you may not have that uh, flexibility. Uh, the second quick start is to set a date well in advance because you'll need plenty of extra time for things that may not have come together as quickly as you would like. And definitely ask for help. You will need lots of help. Uh, I will tell you after having put this on, you need a lot more help than you think. And here's a Google Doc with some of the resources that we had sent out to the FEST participants and some of the planning documents. So you can use these when trying to put one on, on your own. And please do reach out. Here's my email. And I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions because I know that there's a number of different things that people will need assistance with. And I'd love to help, put on, uh, help you put on another event and your own library or organization. All right. Uh, Chris, thank you for sharing um, uh, your experience with the Innovation Fest and uh, how you use that to kind of work towards some creative um, problem solving for libraries. And also, um, what I want to go back to first with some questions here, and, and then I'll just invite, if you have questions for Chris, please put them into the chat. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of time for questions right now. Um, but Chris, I want to go back, and I'm just going to um, go back to some of these image slides so people can take a closer look as we do the questions. And one of the things you talked about was how people were, uh, staff were working in teams. They had come from all over. Um, and I was uh, hoping you could tell us a little bit about um, how you put the teams together and how the teams came to identify the problems uh, that they wanted to uh, work through and try to find a solution for during the day. Sure, and that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we explicitly tried to do, and I had mentioned silo breaking earlier, we tried to put together teams of people who didn't know each other beforehand at all. And that way, um, they were able to connect with people who may not have been, they may have not known before. Um, and the other question of how they get the projects um, settled was we had asked them to uh, submit ideas ahead of time through a type form, which is sort of like a Survey Monkey link. And then uh, we also ask them to express interest, like a sort of interest in what projects they would like to work on. And so we use that as sort of a dual sieve method where we put teams together based on interest, and then we uh, put them together across different organizations so we could get a wide range of experiences. So um, we could they could also break silos among their in their own networks and their own experience. And what types of problems did the groups end up working on? Um, can you give us just a few examples of some of the the problems that people identified to focus on? Sure. Um, so let's see. Uh, some of these are shown in these slides. So this one was really neat. This one is a team who wanted to work on a partnership between animal shelters and libraries. So they came with, this is actually a team that came with their own idea. And then we formed a, um, a team based around that. And this is actually a, a, one of the winning projects. And it was, yeah, it was definitely a 
really a playful presentation. It was really amazing to see them kind of jump into the idea of presenting in a more fun way where they built their own animal ears. And we had put out these stuffed animals as a sort of crea creative aid, and they actually utilized it. Um, another example of a project that was worked on was this team who was from the Pacific Library Partnership. And they were working on a better way of sharing uh, foreign language cataloging expertise where they could have uh, like catalogers who are experts in um, Chinese or Spanish kind of assist in a uh, consortium-wide cataloging endeavor. Uh, let's see. And I can share the uh, full list of projects later on. And let me just end with this one, which was another really cool project. This one was for a library launch pad where it's kind of along the themes of the pop-up library where you would have a small uh, library launch pad that would come up in, say, a laundromat that would offer services like, as you can see in the slide, uh, resume workshops or story times. And this is um, just a really innovative way of reaching out and connecting with our community. Great. Um, and Chris, you've also, in, in sharing all of these examples, we've been seeing different parts of the day. Um, but one thing that I want to go back to and have you explain, and I'll let you move through the slides if you want to show some of the visuals again. But can you say what it was like for the teams coming for this full day event? What was the uh, like order of operations? Or what was the, the uh, agenda for the day for them? Um, and ending with these presentations, of course, that they gave about their final ideas. Um, but what did they do to get there? Sure. Um, so one of the things I had mentioned just very briefly was we worked with Carson Block to create um, mm -hmm. keynotes that would uh, introduce people to the framework of innovation. And this was, these were keynotes that were created ahead of time and shared with people who had signed up for the fest. And so there were two keynotes that happened before the fest itself. And then there was a third one that was the kind of the opening keynote for the fest itself. So people arrived at the fest. We provided food, which was, by the way, it's very important to provide really good food throughout the day. We devoted a, a significant amount of our budget towards food because I believe good food and innovation are very tightly um, connected. So. Uh, they had breakfast, then they had the keynote, then we did some uh, like logistical walking through of the day, which was uh, watch the keynote, and then they were free to break out into their teams to start working. You know, and, and spaces like this, like say you might see in the back of it, it says creative space. Um, and so we had different spaces throughout the library that would allow for different kinds of personalities and design uh, thinkers to find a space that um, was best for them. Like say this was a creative space with a lot of uh, pipe cleaners and uh, construction paper and scissors and markers. So we gave them some time to work on that. And we had the mentors um, who were the organizations within Alameda County that I um, touched on earlier, so mentors from TechSoup, um, from Innovative, and some other organizations um, that were within Alameda County. And then they stopped for lunch. And then after lunch, we gave them time um, to start prepping for their uh, their pitch, so to speak. So this is where you start seeing people really kick it into gear because a lot of time, a lot more time than we had actually anticipated in the very beginning um, was spent on the ideation, people um, trying to come up with the idea, which comes back to the, it was contentious at times, but it was ultimately fruitful. So it, it was actually very, very interesting just to see how people um, went from like, not a lot, just a lot of ideas, and then 
it came to a, an actual physical exhibit in a very rapid way. Uh, and then so after lunch, they had time for the pitching, as I had mentioned. And then at the end of the day, they um, pitched it in front of judges. And uh, this was just a really critical way that I wanted to uh, – and they were pitching for prizes, actually. I built in prizes into the uh, fest because I wanted to also build in um, – some sort of competition, just as a, an additional incentive, so to speak. And so each one of these teams uh, went up and pitched in front of judges, and nobody dropped out, which was really amazing. Everyone was very courageous and risk-friendly, and they all did really well. Great. Uh, so Chris, that's a great way to, to kind of hear how the flow of the day happened. And I want to go back to um, – well, you mentioned uh, Carson being a keynote speaker, and I actually want to come back to this image where you know we had uh, uh, you know you had stations throughout the library, and this one in particular asked the question, "What is your fire in the belly?" And I was wondering if you could give a little bit of context to this particular activity, and then uh, you had mentioned different zones throughout the library. So, if there's anything else you'd like to elaborate on there, as far as the different areas. Uh, beyond this one, but but starting with this one, what is your fire in the belly? Sure. Um, we just really wanted to expose the, I guess, the dreams that each of the uh, attendees were coming with. What were the things that inspire them? Because I think that all library staff have something that drives them to do what they do every day. And so we wanted to express what was the fire that drives them to do amazing things every day? Um, what is the fire that uh, drives them to do just that little bit more? And, and on another note, it was to also help them connect with um, other attendees because they can see, oh, you know, my fire is toddler story time, and then someone else who may be working in a completely different, say, an academic library may also be like, you know what, we also really strongly believe in the power of story time or in telling stories. Um, you may notice on the bottom left there is these handouts, and so one of the things that we did was, that I had mentioned earlier, was the building of a scaffolding framework um, that was to, these were basically handouts that would help guide people and um, thinking about how they would, say, design their project, what it is to uh, some framework for project management, and what is a good way to manage risk. And so um, there was a sort of a pathway. So you would start at this fire in the belly, and then you may see in the top left, um, you could kind of walk around and there are these other stations that let people um, just learn a little bit more about how they should go throughout their day. And uh, Crystal was a really integral part of building that. Um, and you can see kind of the fruits of that in the next slide where people were able to just come up with these really interesting, very diverse questions. Uh, so, Chris, I have um, a couple questions now coming in uh, that I want to get to. Um, and Rachel uh, mentioned, uh, uh, now uh, I'll preface Rachel's question by saying clearly this was a big undertaking. And you can see just through the pictures throughout the library, um, you know, the library being closed that day, the number of people involved. So this was a huge undertaking. And Rachel says, you mentioned admin buy-in, which is no easy task. How did you get your own administration to buy into the Innovation Fest? And that's a really good question. Uh, I was really lucky in my own administration in that they were very open to the idea of uh, putting on a, a, a basically a risky endeavor like this, where it could have um, gone really badly, um, but it turned out really well. Um, it was one of those things where getting buy-in is something 
I worked really hard on from the very start. Um, one of the things that helped was this was all started through a call for um, uh, for applications for what a local consortium calls the innovation grants. That's uh, the Pacific Library Partnership, and so. Before I had even started, I, I reached out to my administration and was like, you know, this is an idea I have. Um, would you be willing to devote the staff time and the resources for me to pull this off? And admittedly, it was um, somewhat more than we had anticipated from the beginning, but my administration was definitely uh, behind me the whole way. So. For uh, those of you listening, it's, I couldn't have done it without the buy-in, and it was not actually a heavy lift. It's just um, be aware when you're doing something like this that it will take up a lot of resources. Uh, I would say that the connections and the, the, the outputs, the just the intangibles were really worth all of it in the end, and it's also a great framework for future endeavors. I mean, I'm getting, like I mentioned earlier, I'm getting uh, questions from both attendees and other administration who attended, which is, you know, when is the next fest? So they uh, definitely saw it as a worthwhile endeavor. Great. Well, it's certainly helpful to hear about your experience. And of course, your event, the Innovation Fest, is, uh, is different from the first one we heard from Sarah. Sarah's was focused on um, working outwardly with the community, and uh, Chris, yours was focused on inward staff development of new ideas, of course, uh, that cross over into the community services, but was really also focused on developing staff skills. So it's interesting to hear that contrast. Uh, we are getting close to the end of our hour, and so um, I think it's time for us to start to wrap up. Um, we did get a few questions that we did not have time to answer, and we will follow up with you later via email on those. So if your question didn't get a response, uh, don't worry. We will get back to you soon. Um, but uh, with that, I think we'll say thank you to Chris and to Sarah and move into just a few more announcements before we wrap up for the day. Uh, now, uh, just one more thing I'll mention uh, is that you will receive an archive of this webinar. It's been recorded, and uh, we'll share the slides with you and all of those links, so you'll be able to access those uh, sometime uh, likely later this week. We'll have that out to you via email, and so you'll be receiving that. Uh, also coming up, uh, we have some upcoming webinars that you may find interesting. On uh, Thursday, June 8th, we have a webinar on accessing TechSoup donations and resources. We also have a library webinar again uh, on Wednesday, June 28th, focusing on the Outside the Lines initiative, uh, and you can learn more about that during the webinar, and how it is helping to shift perceptions of libraries. And there will be a social media focus to that webinar as well. Um, so we're happy to have Outside the Lines back for another webinar this year. Uh, and then if you haven't visited it, uh, you, you should take a look at the TechSoupForLibraries.org website. We have um, blogs and library spotlights and all of our webinar listings there. Um, and you can also sign up for our newsletter, which comes out monthly for TechSoup for Libraries. And there's also an opportunity for you to share your uh, story. So if you have something you'd like to submit, there's um, a way that you can do that there. Um, and so with that, I think we're uh, at the end of our time for the day. I just want to give one uh, thanks to our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk. Um, and that is also available in the TechSoup product donations if you're looking for an online meeting host. It's something that we offer, but ReadyTalk was our sponsor today. And I just want to thank again Chris and Sarah. Thanks for sharing your experiences uh, in this area of uh, libraries serving as innovation hubs and uh, being the cent community-centered design uh, processes that we use for those uh, innovation events. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thanks to all of you for joining us and spending an hour of your time today. We hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>